Gracious God, we need you. Help us. May we hear you and may we listen. In your blessed name, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Listen. 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 Open your ears so that you may hear. Sit yourself down to listen. God is calling us now as we are on this verge in a time of chaos and inequity. God is calling. Do you hear? The books of Samuel take place during a very interesting time in the history of the Israelites. Moses has died. They've made their way into the promised land. Battles have ensued. And now they're settled. And although the land flows with some milk and honey, many of the priests are corrupt. The people are lawless. And some find themselves thinking that maybe God isn't enough. Maybe they need a temporal king. And time-wise, it is at a pivotal place, halfway between God's call of Abraham and the birth of Jesus. It's about a thousand years before the common era. And along comes Hannah, a faithful woman who is bereft, for she is unable to bear a child. And every year she goes to the temple in Shiloh to pray. And she prays so hard and fervently In one year, the temple priest, Eli, he sees her pray. He sees her lips moving unceasingly, the tears trailing down her cheeks, and he's he's, he's taken aback by her fervor and mistakenly presumes that she's drunk. He confronts her, and she says no. No, sir, I am not drunk. I am so desperately unhappy because of the pain of my empty womb. And every year I come here to ask God to bless me with a little one. Eli feels compassion. He takes in her sadness and bearing witness to her faithfulness, he says, go in peace now and may the God of Israel answer your prayers. And God did. Less than a year later, Hannah gave birth to her son. She named him Samuel, and she dedicated him to God. And after he was weaned, she brings him back to the temple to be with Eli for him to spend his life as a priest serving God. And this, then, a few years after, is where our story today picks up. He's older now. He's a preteen or so, Samuel. And he's living in the temple and he's sleeping next to the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of the Holies, when he hears his name being called Samuel, Samuel. And three times he gets up and he runs to the nearby room where Eli is sleeping, thinking that it is Eli who has called him. And twice Eli, completely annoyed, tells him to go back to bed. 
I didn't call you, he says. But the third time that Samuel, God bless him, the third time that Samuel hears his name being called, he runs back into Eli's room again. And this time, Eli, Eli gets it. Even though it was a time when the word of God was rare and visions were not widespread. After the third time, Eli understands this is God speaking to Samuel. And to be fair, imagine how long it would take one of us to come to the conclusion that the voice calling in the night was God. This time, Eli says to Samuel, it's God who's calling you. Go and lay down again next to the Ark of the Covenant. And if perchance you hear your name called this time, Sit up and say, speak, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So he goes back, he lays down, and yes, a fourth time God calls to Samuel, and this time he does not run to Eli. Instead, he says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Imagine. And God speaks And God tells Samuel that God is about to do something that is so amazing, something that will cause anyone who is listening that their ears will tingle. God says, among other things, I will bring down the house of Eli. Eli's sons are priests and they are corrupt. They are unfaithful, they are blasphemous. And Eli, who knows all about it, he knows what they're doing, but he doesn't stop them. Well, after listening to God, Samuel stays in his room, laying close to the ark. He stays there until late morning. He's afraid to go and see Eli for fear that Eli may ask him what God has said to him. But Eli does eventually call to him, and he says to Samuel, speak the truth. Tell me what God said. Tell me all. So Samuel does, and Eli is chastened when he hears about the demise of his house and his sons. And he says, let it be as God has said to you. When Samuel grows, And Samuel spends his life in the service of the Lord. Samuel becomes a great trusted prophet, eventually anointing Saul, the first king of the Israelites. And then when it is clear Saul is not the right one, he shows enough courage to find David and to anoint David, the greatest king of Israel. So it's an interesting story from some 3,000 years ago. But you may be asking yourself, what in heaven's name might it have to do with us? Us, here, a week and a half after our nation's capital was ransacked and desecrated, 11 days since our republic, our democracy, and our leaders were imperiled by a riotous crowd, created by lies, half-truths, and conspiracies, promulgated by politicians who chose to ignore facts and dispatched into action by an amoral, self-absorbed president, and then perhaps unknowingly or knowingly led by more than a few right-wing hate groups. What does this story have to do with us? And as I look at it, I see some parallels. I'm struck by a chaotic society, not satisfied with God as a leader, but longing for a king to tell them what to do. I am struck by a corrupt order of religious people who claim to be of God, but instead continuously blaspheme in word and deed. I am struck by people of faith 
who need to hear God call them four different times before they say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And I'm struck and filled with some hope that Samuel took a bit of time to reflect before he acts. He does not run in immediately to Eli's room to tell him God's word. Instead, he waits. He waits until Eli asks to hear, until Eli can listen. And I am struck that Samuel grows strong and speaks God's words and people listen and the world changes bit by bit. And the chaos is reduced and some order comes to be. Hands on this Martin Luther King weekend. And for the next few weeks, I long for us to be quick to pray, attentive in our listening, and maybe a bit slower to act. I don't usually say those words. But let's talk about the listening. Who are we and who might we be listening to? Who do I listen to? People who hold the same opinions as we do? I certainly enjoy doing this because it makes me feel better about my own beliefs. But do I gain a different perspective? We could listen to people who espouse racist beliefs and nefarious white supremacist views. And, and I think I, and I think we need to do a bit of this because it's important to know what people are saying, what people, other people are hearing. But I know that if I become too obsessed with this, it fuels me with a deep, deep anger that I think prevents me from doing the hard work of beginning to understand why a wide swath of our country is so very, very angry and distrustful and so very afraid, seemingly, of diversity, equality, and inclusion. Why are so many people seemingly afraid of Dr. King's Dream that that dream may be realized in our country. Why are so many of us who claim to be Christian afraid of having power and access to power equally distributed across all races and classes? Why do so many of us who follow Christ Believe that our world is an apple pie where if you get a big piece, I must get a small one. Why do we not understand that God's grace is so much more than that? What if we slowed down and took the time and asked these questions in our own families? So many of us have relatives, family members, high school friends, college people who have different perspectives than ours. What if we took the time to really listen and to hear and to pause, to reflect, and then to ground ourselves in God to embrace God's time, and to then thoughtfully, carefully create our response to all of this chaos. Let us not add our own adrenaline to this system. Let us listen long and hard before we speak. 
Let us stay away from all places of public demonstration. Let us listen, as the German theologian Karl Barth said, with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. And to be fair, if Karl Barth was alive today, I'm sure he would be on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. But let us view all of that news with God's word in the other hand. In this day and age, in a time when God's word seems rare and visions are not widespread, let us be the ones who sit up and listen, who seek understanding and new insights. Let us be the ones who spend our nights waiting for God's holy word, knowing that when we do listen, when we do hear, when we do digest and learn, then we, then we are the ones, then we are the ones who will need to act. Friends, we are people of faith, and God acts through us, and God loves through us. And God has done that before, and God will do it again with us. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be with you this morning and remain with you always. Amen.